Hello audience, we are moving on to our second slot of the day. I am directing this to the pilot of Students' Life that is our fellow lecturer for the question. Dr. Iwan, you are one of the lecturers who used to study here in UPM. So, could you tell us your experience on how do you get to where you are now? Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, my my story is not so dramatic. It's, it's quite straightforward, really. But what will be helpful to you is I'm going to try to remember some details from what happened and maybe try to point out some life principles or tactics that you can adopt um, despite our different circumstances. So by the time I was in the final year, I I didn't actually know exactly what job I want to get. And internship wasn't part of the core curriculum back then. So I had no idea how working life is like, um, what kind of jobs out there um, as a biotech student. But I knew two things. Firstly, I knew that I wanted to get a PhD. It doesn't matter in what field, but I knew I want to get one. And it wasn't because I like lab research or experiments that much. I, I never did. But because for me, a PhD is the highest formal learning program there is. And I love learning and I wanted to see if I could get to the highest level. And it wasn't because the, the second thing that I knew about myself was I want to be in education, a teacher or a trainer of some kind, because I believe that's a fundamental way of improving the conditions of the ummah, of the society. And I love learning and training and teaching others is an honorable excuse to improve my own learning. So I suppose that that would be your your first principle, right? So you don't need to know exactly what job you want to get now. I mean, it would be brilliant if you do know, but don't feel panicky if you are graduating soon and you have no idea what job you're going to aim for. At the same time, you need to generate some kind of ideas of I mean, what's authentic really to you, know, what's true to you, and what is and what's not who you are, what you like, what you don't like. And what you don't like is just as important as what you like. I knew I liked learning and education, but as importantly, I knew that I didn't want to start a, a biotech company or, or be a full-time lab research uh, and scientists or, or, or being sales executive for a tech company, you know? So it doesn't mean that you will get everything that feels true, feels authentic to you and avoid everything that you don't want to do. But thinking about these things is a, is a useful navigational setup, right? To, to decide a broad direction of where you want to go it helps narrow things down, right? So for example, if after you graduate, you, you have three choices. One is to do a master's degree. Um, the other one, you can join a family business. And the other one, um, you can apply for a lab position at a hospital or at AstraZeneca. So if you know enough about yourself, you can probably eliminate one of those, right? So you can focus your energy to evaluate the remaining two. So even if you don't know exactly what job you're aiming for, make sure you think about the, the broad direction of where you want to go. Okay, so after I graduated, I applied to be a research assistant at MTech, at Prof Rajas Lab. It's mostly a practical decision because I needed to buy food and pay the rent. And also I want to gain some experience in the lab. And at the same time, uh, at the same time I'm trying also to look for a long-term uh, opportunities. So Prof Raji gave me that temporary job. Dr. Adam Leo was there. He was a postdoc there. 
Dr. Suryana was there, Dr. Dina, Dr. Baya, they were doing their masters back then. And at the same time, uh, and around, around that time, Alhamdulillah, I got called by the head of the department, uh, Prof. Nurhani. So I was in her office when she told me that the, the department is looking for a tutor and they will consider promoting you to a lecturer later if you get a PhD. So she asked me, would you be interested to be a tutor? So I was like, yes. I knew it was a yes because it fits with the broad direction that I mentioned before. Now, had someone else came to me offering, you know, they're going to say, we are running a startup business on a, on a biotech product and we want to partner up with you. So we'll give you, I don't know, 30% of equities. I probably would say no, even though the offer might be better financially because it doesn't feel like me. It's not where I want to go to. So I accepted that tutorship offer and and the primary job when you when you when you are a tutor was to find a phd position overseas so i did actually ask because prof nohani the head of department like can i just do I my postgraduate study my master's my phd at mtech so at prof I lab that tutorship and she said no and it, it and has to be overseas when you, when you have you to find a phd position a phd position so because of that, I learned so how to I apply for a PhD position. Can I just so you, you, you want to hear this because some of the staff may be similar to applying for internship placements or, or a job positions. It has to be overseas. So number one, number one, you want to focus on an appropriate communicate with a native English speaker from overseas so I need to make sure that I write email in clear English I remember spending so much time studying the basics of English grammar just to make sure that I use the sentences properly because I didn't have elex like you guys have so so um, I need to make sure that I needed to study I needed to study spending so much time English outside of the curriculum. So today you can use apps like ProWriting Aid, Grammarly, and Ginger to proofread your writing. Um, however, if you are applying for agency or company that use the Malay language predominantly or to supervisors from UKM who do their postgrad degree in Malay, write in proper Malay language, right, to project your professionalism in your writing um, and so don't write in english in uh, in, however, in that case so you can use ukm has this website called uh, portal maya istila science so you can use that website so that's number one number two when you want to apply for a phd position you want to think about how you can customize your approach so don't send the same emails to multiple potential supervisors. You want to tailor each one of your email to address specifically to each lecturer. So in order to do that, you, you want to read about them, what they're working on, find something about their work that you genuinely like, and then tell them why you like it, what you like about it. And the same thing goes with your curriculum vitae, your CV. So your CV might need to be adjusted depending on who you are sending it to. So if your potential supervisor is from university overseas, they might not be able to appreciate your achievements in your secondary schools, right? So you can take that out of your CV. And if they're not from this faculty, if they're not from biotech, and you want to put in, for example, your biomix involvement in your CV, you might want to put like a short comment about what that organization is so that they know what this organization is in and they can appreciate what you have achieved. And you can also write about why do you want to do your study with that particular supervisor? I mean, why have you read about their research? So that they know what this organization is in. You can, you should avoid 
asking them to find you another supervisor. So I've seen emails like that sometimes. So they say if you if you're not uh, if you if you don't have a place for me, could you please um, ask another supervisor another lecture to supervise me? So don't do that because I, I guess you can do that if you if you know them personally and have worked with them before. Because otherwise, it gives it gives them a, a bad impression of your of your assertiveness, right? You want people to do things for you. So little things like that, the extra effort can uh, set you apart from other candidates. Um, and then you just work on 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 volume. You you send your emails to as many lecturers as you can. You go go you go to the websites of different universities i think you have to send emails to at least 15 different supervisors maybe 20 and inshallah you get one you just need one anyway and don't feel bad about rejections i got a re reply where the supervisor said basically he didn't think i was good enough to do a phd with his group which i took positively right so because whenever possible you want to know if you're not good enough before you start something so that you don't waste your energy there. You can redirect yourself to other more promising opportunities. There was another supervisor also, I remember, she said she's interested in my application and, and we got on quite well, but then she stopped replying to my emails. Um, I have no idea why. I hope she's all right. And very often, the supervisors, they just say no because they don't have a place available. Like right now, if you want to do a postgraduate study with me, I can't take you because I don't have the grant money to support your project. Oh yes, that's another thing. You will have much higher chances of getting accepted for a PhD position if you can find your own source of scholarship to pay for your living expenses. Right, so that's a big plus. So see if you can apply for scholarship before you apply for master or, or PhD positions. So that, that's what that's what you do. So eventually I got a PhD position in Australia and it's quite a struggle. So I suppose I'll tell you more about the PhD experience if it comes up later. Um, but the short of it is when I came back, I was called for the interview to, to the interview to be a lecturer here. And, and once you started working as a lecturer, you, you need to learn a lot on the job. Because when you do your PhD, you primarily do, you primarily do research. And when you start working as a lecturer, you have other dimension of your career. You have to learn about teaching. You learn have to learn about like a paperwork, some administrative stuff. And so what I did was, for example, for teaching, um, I actually attended, I joined the class of Dr. Wan Zuhainis because she was one of the, one of the, um, how do you say one of the reputable lecturers here when it comes to teaching so actually come to her class sit at the back and watch how she teach how she teaches um so you might want to do something similar if you get to a new job try to find someone who has been there uh, who have more experience working at that place and try to kind of shadow them okay so that's how i ended here I, I, will end, I will end with this. So that, that tutorship offer, that's a crucial turning point. Um, so metaphysically speaking, that is God opening the door for me. So it wasn't me, it wasn't because I deserved it. In Islam, it's called rizq, like provision, rizqi. So he, he opens different doors to different people not based necessarily on what we want but but based on his hikmah his wisdom that doesn't mean that you will just get good opportunities without effort sure there wasn't much effort 
at the end, I don't remember even applying for that tutorship position formally. So that door was open for me. But I did put massive, massive effort to be in front of that door in the first place. Because the reason the faculty agreed to offer me that tutorship was because they knew who I was. Because when I was a student like you, I was active in classes. I worked hard to understand lessons and asking good questions to lecturers. I, I prepared well during assignment presentations. Oh yeah, the head of the department, Prof. Nohani, she came to one of my presentations during my final year. I remember I was presenting about ERID. ERID is Emergence and Reemergence of Infectious Diseases. So back then, we, we students, we didn't know why, why she was there. Head of departments don't normally come to students' presentations. But now I know. She was there to see me presenting. Right? If I were, if I were lazy and did a rubbish job on that presentation, she probably would go to the department meeting and say, oh, I saw Irwan's presentation today and it's not a lecturer material. So things might turn out differently with my career. I was also active at the faculty. I was the president of Biomix. I was terrible though at the residential college activities because I was an introvert with very poor social skills. And the college, Ya Allah, there were so many college activities and I couldn't do those and try to study and do well in, in my exams. I, rem I remember a college senior coming to my room and, and pressured me to, to join some kind of activities outside. And I said, I can't because I've got an exam tomorrow. And you know what, what he said? He said, your classmates also have exams tomorrow and they are out there doing the college activities. So why can't you? And you know what I said? I said, well, if they have exams tomorrow, they shouldn't be out there. They should be in their rooms prepping for the exam. You see, um, so I had a, a minor fallout with my seniors. So I wasn't their favorite person in college. Well, it went bad that I chose to leave the college in the first year, in the second semester. I couldn't even finish a whole year staying in college. Because I respect them. I don't want things to get out of hand and I can see where they're coming from. It's just, you know, enough to do both. So I decided to focus on my study and I only became active in the co-curriculum, in the biomix, especially during my maybe that year when, I, when I'm confident I was more experienced in studying. So, so that strategy worked and and my CGPA wasn't awful in the end. I got a first class degree. So, so you see, um, I'm telling you all this as an example of an important principle. So that career, career opportunities comes to us sometimes, not because we are stressing out, chasing after it, right? Uh, I didn't know about what will happen when I left college to focus on my study in the first year. And every time I prepare for my assignment, I didn't know that one day the head of the department is going to come and watch my presentation. That's, that's all just risk, provision from God. What you can do right now, if you're feeling a bit anxious, you're feeling about um, what's going to happen to me after I graduate, um, you, you do your best to look at the, the options that you have. And then you try to take care of the current responsibilities. Take care of it however imperfectly. So you do your best in your assignments. You do your best in your exams. You try to be active in core curricular activities like the biomix. And then, and then you, put, you put your tawaka, you put your faith in the mechanics of reality that if we do the right things, God will open appropriate doors for us in the future. Right. I think, I think that's all from me for now.